and welcome back to the program. Great to welcome right now a man who's written a very interesting book about high school football, but it's a lot more than that. It's kind of uh, what goes on in uh, many parts of the country that uh, uh, a high school football coach is doing a lot more than just uh, playing and teaching football. It's called Across the River. Life, Death, and Football in an American City. And we're joined today by uh, Washington Post sports uh, writer uh, Kent Babb, who uh, not only wrote this book, but he actually wrote a uh, column about it uh, before that that led to this book. We'll find out about it right now. And uh, Kent joined us by telephone. Good to talk to you, Kent. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, good to have a chance to chat with you for, for a few minutes. Uh, you're talking to someone who uh, who uh, broadcast high school football for about 10 seasons down here in Florida. So, uh, it, it had special interest to me to, to kind of read about this, uh, although uh, there are cities in Florida, I guess, similar to the one you write about here. That's, we're talking about uh, just outside New Orleans where uh, uh, the kids uh, come from rough neighborhoods. But uh, I've seen a little bit of that down here in Florida. But, boy, that really is a interesting uh, town, uh, I guess, Algiers, uh, Louisiana, right? Yeah, and, and it's quite literally right across the river from the French Quarter. So uh, if you or listeners have been, uh, you know, like I have, like uh, to the French Quarter in New Orleans, New Orleans, try to throw a few back, uh, forget the rest of the world. Uh, if you stand in Jackson Square, kind of where the beautiful St. Catherine, uh, Patrick, uh, excuse me, St. Louis Cathedral uh, is, you can see Algiers right across. It's, uh, it's sort of that uh, block of land, and, and there's sort of this amazing uh, drama playing out, lots of young lives, and, and a pretty incredible football program. Yeah, I think kind of like uh, Florida, Texas, obviously, and uh, any place really in the uh, kind of the deep south, uh, football is uh, you know is the game. We're going back to pee wee football, and of course high school football and college. Uh, but this is an area, and a lot of towns like that, unfortunately, throughout the country, where the kids, uh, mostly inner city kids or rural kids, I guess, too, just uh, are trying to escape uh, some terrible life they're living. I guess football gives them a chance. And this coach you talk about, Bryce Brown, uh, has done an incredible job there. How did you find out about him in the first place? Yeah, uh, good question. And, 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 yeah, I mean, football is, is a sport. And sports in general, I think, are it's, it's possible to teach so many things through this game. It's very complex, obviously. But, you know, great coaches know how to simplify it. They understand it. Um, and, and I came across Bryce in 2018 when I wrote a, a feature story about him and his program in the Washington Post. And what, what really struck me about him, you know, a couple of things. One is he's just a mountain of a human. He's roughly 400 pounds. He's a younger guy. He's only 33 or 34. Yeah. Um, but he, he looks so much older. Looks older that, in the pictures, in the yeah. Uh, it surprised me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like he, he – <laughs> like he he's not i mean he does not appear to be a young person that's probably because like he just treats himself really poorly and you know i think the reason he does that after getting to know him and, and his program you know for quite a while now is he's got this saying a lot of coaches have these uh sayings these mantras they repeat um you know one that bryce says is sort of at once inspiring and haunting is you have to give a life to save a life and, and i believe and people around him believe that that he may be willing to sacrifice, you know, not just like his own time and his sleep and, you know, like he brings players food and sometimes clothing, but I, there are people in, in Bryce's orbit who believe that he is willing to sacrifice, sacrifice no less than his own life to save these young people. And he has no kids of his own. He's not married. Uh, most of his friends are in the football office. He doesn't socialize outside uh, football. Um, it's, it's jarring. I mean, it's, he's very valuable. It's, you know, kind of unbelievable to see somebody who is so necessary in this country to provide purpose for people for kids who aren't his own but he adopts them almost like as his own like he, he believes his call in life is to help save these kids to redirect them to teach them that they're not just you know capable of amazing things but they're worthy of it too yeah and again for the people listening or friends listening it's not just about high school football it's about this man in particular, Bryce Brown, who, uh, like you said, is trying to teach these kids or basically save these kids, so many of them, uh, some die, unfortunately, some, you know, uh, wind up in jail or, you know, go down the wrong track. And and he doesn't make a lot of money, but whatever money he has, uh, you talk about it in the book, uh, you know, he'll give, he'll spend his own money to buy food or just drive around the neighborhoods to make sure these kids are, are home, right? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's sort of this, like, sort of bearded, but draggled Robin Hood of the gridiron. And, you know, like, he's in horrible, horrible shape. And I do care about him. I mean, I just don't think you spend as much time as I did with, with somebody when you're writing a book about him without kind of developing some affection. You either really care about him or you start to hate him. And I, so I really, I really do care about Bryce, but I also worry about him. But, but look, I mean, this is a community where, you know, we talk about 
shootings in this country. And, you know, a lot of times it is in communities of color. And we talk about like the south side of Chicago or Baltimore, St. Louis, um, you know, South Florida, a lot of times. I mean, the, the, the Gulf Coast where you're at, I mean, like it has its pockets. The difference in New Orleans is that shots ring out at any hour in any neighborhood. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor. The first story I wrote about gun violence in New Orleans was in 2016, a particularly bloody year there, um, where Will Smith, the former defensive end for the Super Bowl champion Saints, got gunned down in probably the richest part of town. Right. And you know, I, I was just walking around down there, and I'm like, how does that happen? Like, how, how does it happen here? How does it happen to him? And somebody from City Hall called me the night the story posted on the Washington Post, and it wasn't that they were upset that this had happened so much. It was that they were upset that I was pointing out that this had happened. And, you know, Bryce is great because he's honest about it. He believes that you have to confront these problems, these issues. And, you know, he, he really believes he can use football as a vehicle to teach, you know, not just like how to win games. Look, when the story, when the book starts, they've won three consecutive state championships. And in Florida, you know this, uh, it's hard to win. Sure. The same is true in Louisiana, which produces like a – super high number of per capita NFL players. Um, they've won three straight state championships, so they're not just winning games and, and competing for championships, but they're really providing purpose, you know, and teaching life and survival skills to a, to a group of young people, you know, in a city besieged by gun violence. Was he uh, a willing participant? I, I know when he did the original article and then uh, when he decided to do the book, uh, I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a lot of salty language he uses and, you know, not uncommon in football coaches, but uh, he is kind of a salty guy, right? He's salty. I'd say he's salty. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the one sort of agreement that we made was, you know, they wanted me to tell the story just as it is. You know, don't sugarcoat it. Don't, you know, make it more, you know, kind of, kind of palatable. You know, this is really what it takes. This is how you have to talk to kids who are traumatized. I mean, after after Katrina hit um, New Orleans in 2005, I mean, just got to think, this is an entire generation of kids who have experienced trauma, homelessness, murder. So here, here's a, a crazy stat. When I did that first story, Bryce, he's kind of a sociologist, like a mad social scientist with a whistle. <laughs> um, so he stood in front of, I mean, it's a big team. So they've got they've got about 100 players and coaches. So after practice one day, he just wanted to see what happened. Uh, he asked the whole team, hey, raise your hand if you don't know somebody who's been gunned down. Nobody raised his hand. So yeah. that means everybody on the team, coaches, players, everybody, support staff, they know somebody who's been murdered. Post-Katrina, this is just a – it's like the Wild West in some ways. People just – they a lot of people don't know – how to resolve conflicts. They don't know how to de-escalate an argument. You know, maybe you and I grew up getting into a fist fight with somebody. Places like this, people in, in communities like this, they reach for guns. And it's heartbreaking. It's not necessary. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to Bryce Brown either. And so he says, all right, come with me. Come play football. Yes, but we're going to teach you how to communicate. We're going to teach you how to de-escalate these situations. It's like recognizing the blitz for a quarterback. You right. see this thing coming, and you have to learn how to step out of the way, and you got to make the pass anyway. You got to keep going, whether it's during a traffic stop, whether it's during an argument. We all deal with adversity. We all deal with people who are, you know, getting on us or trying to rattle our cage. But how do you respond? And that's what he's really teaching. Yeah, well, that, was, that was the worst of it when we were kids, probably just uh, pushing and shoving. <laughs> Nobody ever thought about guns or knives. <laughs> and I grew up in New York, you know, so uh, <laughs> Long Island, but as kids. But now these kids are used to it, unfortunately. Uh, of seeing people get shot. Little kids see that, so it's sad. Yeah, the protagonist of the book, so Bryce is the main character, but there's a senior linebacker named Joe Thomas. And, you know, he, he grew up on the streets. I mean, his mom was a drug dealer. She was, a you know, kind of a gangster in New Orleans. Like, when the book starts, she's in prison. And, you know, he knows he wants something different, but he has no idea how to achieve it. And, you know, like, he, he witnessed his first murder when he was eight years old. Mm. And it was because during the dice game, somebody took a dollar, a dollar, you know, and that was enough to kill somebody. And like, yeah. it's just, it, it doesn't make sense. And there's just, it, the sad part is, you know, there's just not enough sort of talk about how to peacefully resolve conflict. Everybody's going to disagree. Everybody's going to argue. Everybody experiences that. But just in some communities in this country, there's just not, nobody has bothered to take the time to teach some of these young people, traumatized young people in a lot of cases, that there's a different way.
Unfortunately, we're out of our allotted time, but uh, it is a great book, and we recommend it Across the River, Life, Death, and Football in an American City. And uh, we've been talking to Kent Babb today. And, uh, Kent, uh, I know it's available everywhere, but do you have a, a particular website you want to direct people to? Yeah, it is available everywhere, so it should be uh, in bookshops. I'm encouraging people to support their local booksellers. They really need us. But if you go to goacrosstheriver.com, uh, I'll point you in the direction. If you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at by Kent Babb, and on Twitter, it's at Kent Babb. Great. Kent, pleasure talking to you. Uh, continued success, and hopefully we can talk to you again. Thanks for being with us. Great. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America.